Dear Thomas, first of all, thank you very much for the pleasure of this interview. You are an art historian, you are an expert of the works of Albrecht Dürer, and you are, last but not least, the Director General of the City Museums in Nuremberg. Thanks for being part of our ICOM NPR Challenge 2020 Narratives Long Story Short. Well, Matthias, thank you for being with you, for being part of this project. And um, well, I think storytelling in museums, via artworks, via guides, via curators, uh, of course, from this very special point of view, from this working place, Nuremberg, where I'm talking to you now, um, uh, makes it very uh, easy since we had here one of the most famous German Renaissance artists, Albrecht Dürer, who also is famous because of his role in the history of media, in the history of storytelling. And so I would suggest to use some of his artworks to discuss your issue this evening. Thomas, everybody is talking about branding and about brand building and communication, especially, especially with the help of visual media. One might think that this is a simple task for PR to come, but communication works only when there is content. In the course of COVID-19 pandemic, many museums have spontaneously tried to tell stories about their objects by digital means. But can museums themselves learn from history? By what means, for example, have artists in the past told stories and developed their narratives? That's my first question. Well, the answer is already depicted on the wall here. Um, during the last decades, I had the pleasure to learn from Dürer and his art that there are two kinds of stories that are um, of value that can be told successively um, to our audience in the museums. First is the story that is told by the artist himself, by the artwork. Uh, and in the, course of the, in the case of Dürer, it's uh, of course 500 years ago, but it still works as you will see, I think. And the second way to tell stories is the uh, story that um, uh, is, has its relevance in our own time, uh, that we can tell from the retrospective point of view, on example, given the provenance of an object, the fortune or the misfortune an object had during the times after it was made, and the genesis, um, the artist's uh, posthumous fame, or also the oblivion of the artist that he perhaps was forgotten. So let's try it with this way, tell two kinds of stories, looking at some pieces of art Dürer had made. Uh, it's my everyday life work to explain that then to the audience. Example given, there are the four horsemen um, of the apocalypse and uh, in our times of Corona, you asked for that. Uh, it's really difficult to discipline oneself not to start uh, with the second story, that is the present time story that uh, it has uh, the relevance for our time, but to be disciplined and look at the moment when it was made. Dürer was a quite young man when he decided in 1498 to illustrate this, to a certain extent, difficult book of the Christian Bible, the Apocalypse. Uh, it's difficult to understand, to read an enigmatic text. Uh, and what does Dürer do? He tells the story via image. The text is quite difficult. The image is stunning. It's like a Hollywood uh, interpretation of a criminal story. Four men, you can see them there uh, as they are described in the Apocalypse text. Uh, one, uh, the personification of the death, one of the war, one um, of the plague coming across the world and he depicts them like heroes that do destroy all the world. You see the small person right down in the corner, that's to a certain extent um, uh, the world, that are we and the plague is running over them. A kind of storytelling that was really new in this time and to know who did it. And Dürer answered this question by putting his monogram into this uh, uh, depiction, into this print, 
Also, that's a very new kind of storytelling. Every story needs its author. He was a multi-talent, let's say. He was an artist. He was a storyteller. He was a self-marketer. And he was an author. And uh, please, can you explain to us, using this famous graphic of the rhinoceros as an example, what is the real story? What made Dura out of it? I think the woodcut of the rhinoceros uh, suits very good um, to explain these two approaches of storytelling that uh, we are enabled by such famous objects of art, in this case of um, incunabula, of early information telling via mass media. Um, you know, the invention of the print by Gutenberg uh, was just one to place one generation before. So it was a very um, modern way to bring information into societies all over Europe. And in 1515, Dürer did something quite unusual for an artist that was used to make self portraitures and famous large scale uh, paintings. He made a kind of short um, breaking news um, by depicting an event that took place far away from Nuremberg. And so I would suggest just let's have these two uh, glasses to look at it. First in Dürer's time, Dürer times, what is Dürer's story? And then what could be the story of a curator, of a guide, a museum guide nowadays? Um, Dürer tells us a lot inside this woodcut. It uh, is a combination of text and of image. And as a third part, it gives also the information on the author. That's important. You see Dürer's monogram a AD on the right part. Uh, it has a title like any good newspaper and breaking news must have. Rhinoceros is written there. And it has a date because the year 1515 means this happened, this was seen exactly in this year. Text tells um, that um, this animal arrived on 1st of May in Portugal, in Lisbon, as a gift from a ruler in India to the king of Lisbon. And the name, the text continues, the name of this exotic animal is Rhinoceros. Uh, the, 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 the author of the text stresses that it exactly looks this way uh, and that the biggest enemy of the rhinoceros is the elephant. Um, the image explains very detailed, with a very detailed structure, the surface, the skin, the hairs of this, to a certain extent, ugly creature, ugly creature, exotic creature for every European around 1550. This is the first story, but there is also a second one. Is that true? The image and the texts are very concrete, are fascinating, are sensational, because the animal was quite well known to educated people from classical texts, from antiquity. But nobody knew if this kind of monster really exists. And now Dürer, a German artist living in Nuremberg, far, far away from Lisbon, uh, stresses that he knows and he gives the information about the existence, the reality of this image. Um, and there the second story starts, is that mass media information, is that scientific illustration, is that breaking news, is that fake news, is what is the source Dürer had? Did Dürer see the animal? He stresses in the text, it looks exactly this way, but where from do, does he know that? Did he have information from another artist that sent him a rough drawing? And did he describe it via uh, illustration only from texts, though this is a kind of translation, one could call it, from a text to an image? And around these questions, many articles, many art historical essays have been written um, and this illustration became very famous for other illustrators in 16th, in 17th, in 18th century, because up to the midst of the 18th century, 
this was the only existing illustration uh, that stressed to be true an European could have of such, such a rhinoceros. This is the second story. And so it doesn't wonder that a uh, very uh, prominent uh, contemporary of us, Neil McGregor, director, uh, former director of the British Museum, when he was asked what is his most beloved, the superlative object of the British Museum's collection, he had chosen Durer's Rhinoceros for that very uh, good and beautiful title, the most important object of the British Museum. And what was his approach? How did he translate this image to the audience? His approach was that it's not exclusivity, that it's not a value in the art market that makes an object prominent and important and worth to tell the story about it, but it is, is its function, in this case, the start of the mass media culture that we live from up to now by looking to uh, Instagram, looking to Facebook, wanting exact that what Dura delivered to an audience in Europe in the year 1550. This is the second story that is as much important as the first story, which is the one Dura tells us. Thank you very much. Um, coming to your job, to your new job as Director General of the City Museums of Nuremberg, what story do you want to tell about the city of Nuremberg to your audience? Uh, well, one always has to, kick to, to, to pay attention to talking about the audience, as you know. There is not one audience, there are many audiences, uh, but uh, regarding uh, Durer, I think um, we should more talk about community at the moment in the 21st century about communication of information. Durer as an information artist and not so much uh, as uh, uh, on Durer as a genius artist. And this is a new view on these things and we had the stories about that. Um, and therefore, the rhinoceros is more suitable, more uh, uh, has more appears more information than, uh, for instance, beautiful paintings uh, that are displayed in galleries can do. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. It was a great pleasure for me to talk to you about narratives. Long story short. Bye bye, and see you in Nuremberg. Bye bye. See you.